So um, um, my name's uh, Rhonda Jones, I, and I'm the person who does um, uh, who does stats help requests for statistics help requests from for, through TARC to uh, uh, clinicians who want who want to be able to do some research but haven't necessarily done any statistics, which is um, exceptionally common. <laughs> so so. Um, uh, before we before we start, I might ask the three of you, what um, do 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 you guys have any background in statistics? Did you do any as an undergraduate or or no, nothing at all, Michael? What about you, Bianca? Uh, no, I don't have any qualifications in statistics, but I'm a data analyst at Northern Queensland PHN. Okay. So um, I didn't really have anything specific that I wanted to talk about. I just saw this come up and I thought it'd be really interesting to, to hear what you guys are doing and how you do it. Okay. Well, okay. I mean, I, 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 I think, yeah, that, that's okay. That's, that's, that's um, uh, an interesting mix. <laughs> we'll see how we go. All right. Well, what I might do is, is share my screen at this point. Let's see. Uh, Okay, has everybody got that? Yep. Okay, so this is actually a this this talk is a bit of a follow up from um, uh, the talk that that we had uh, or the talk ran a couple of weeks ago about. Um, about getting and, and cleaning up data. So this one essentially assumes that you've got some data um, and a question you want to use it to answer. And, and it's a matter of, of um, um, either figuring out what analyses you're gonna do yourself or um, figuring out enough about the data set to have a, have a um, if you like, an informed conversation with whoever you're going to get to help you do the analysis, and and either of those things is is useful. Is um, so so uh, for anybody who's just arrived, um, uh, feel free to interject at any point um, because we've got we've got few enough people here that that's going to be possible. Um, and um, uh, since we don't have anybody managing this, if you if you can uh, keep your video on so that you can, if you wave at me, I, I know that that's what you're doing. Uh, that would probably be helpful too. Okay, so um, if, um, if you were at the previous talk, um, that covered essentially getting the data set right. Um, and this one is really about the, the first question about once you start down the analytical phase of this, in other words, figuring out what kind of analysis you might do. And there's, and this is a gigantic, gigantic subject, right? especially because in the last 20 years, what you can do in terms of analysis has expanded massively. So there, there are now many, many options that just weren't there uh, 20 years ago. So, this first question is the one that we're going to focus on. Um, and if you're using uh, routinely collected data for the, for, the, for the study you're trying to do, um, that's in the, the business about analyzing the data is generally more difficult than it would be if you were if you collected the data specifically yourself, specifically to answer whatever question you want. And there's several reasons for that. I mean, the, the main one is because, of course, the data wasn't collected in order to answer your question. So it's not designed to do the kind of thing you want. You have to make it do the thing you want. Um, and that means things like that you would, uh, if you were designing a study, you would make sure you included like um, criteria for including and excluding subjects. Um, making sure that you had, if, if you've got two groups that you want to compare, that you had plenty of data in each group. Um, things like 
um, making sure the variables that we might be interested in are all, are all in the data set. You, you really can't guarantee that because you, you had no say in, in actually collecting the data. So um, quite often um, doing analysis on routinely collected data requires a bit more um, ingenuity than you might than it would do if, if it was a, a if it was a, a trial that you had designed yourself and collected the data for yourself. So um, let's let's um, go through the process that you might use to decide on on what analysis you want with a particular data set, which happens to be um, one which which um, we got asked to help with. Uh, some time back, and this is a tiny bit of that data, um, but it's but it's not a bad one for um, seeing what you what you might the process you need to go through. So let me show you the data set. Can you really is that is that big enough for you that you can at least semi read it? Okay. So what this was about, it's it's a it's a small bit um, of a of a much bigger data set. And what the person wanted to do was to, there, there's, there's a parent that you're going to know more about this than I am because um, there are more than there's more than one way of measuring blood oxygen levels. Um, the gold standard, if you like, is this O2HB measurement. Um, but it's easier and quicker and cheaper to do a second method, which is here labeled SpO2. And if, I'm, if I understood the clinical side correctly, this one um, requires um, serious effort to get the blood sample and this you can get out of the thumb. Okay, so it's, uh, uh, this is much easier than that. Um, what, the, what the person wanted to know was, um, uh, under what circumstances could you safely use this easier blood collection method to measure to measure blood oxygen um, without risk to the patient? So, um, and because blood oxygen levels, uh, normal blood oxygen levels are, are, are very much on the high side, what that really means is, is this one going to tell you reliably enough when, when it drops? Okay. So in this data set, we've got, we've got the, the two kinds of measurement, which is what we're really looking at. Um, there's also a value for the difference between them um, so that you can think about, you can think of the question in a way as um, uh, if, the, if the difference is small, it's, it's going to be safe enough. When does the difference get large or does the difference get, get large? Because that's the point at which it's not going to be safe. Um, at which point, at initial, an initial skim of the data, you might start worrying, for example, about this one. <laughs> but, um, but um, and indeed, that turned out to be the final answer, but it's not going to be. Then, then there's also a whole lot of other things in this data set, which I haven't included all of, which are things that the investigator thought might affect oxygen levels, and in particular, might affect the difference between those two measurements. So they include what the person has been diagnosed with, a, some sort of severity score for that diagnosis, um, whether they, or not they were indigenous, um, whether they were smokers, which I gather affects your oxygen levels, um, heart rates, um, I forget what those are, the percentage of abnormal hemoglobin when you, did a, when you had a look at the blood sample. So, Essentially, these were all things that the investigator, uh, the clinical investigator, thought might might matter um, when looking at blood oxygen. Okay, so is that all reasonably? Is the data set reasonably clear? Okay. So, um, at that point, so that's the data. Um, at that point, we want to say, um, all right, what? Let's, let's ask the question in general terms, and then we want to formalise the question in terms of that data. So um, the, the general question was, was really straightforward. So is that alternative measurement of blood oxygen, is that a good alternative to the gold standard technique over the whole range of values? In particular, does it 
is it reliable when the values get low when you really want to know that it's accurate? So the, 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 the next steps in terms of getting to one analysis you might use are to say, okay, what are the variables in that data set that are directly relevant to your research question? Okay, so which ones are, the, are, are implicit in your research question? You utterly cannot do without them. Um, and, um, in that, and once, you, once you've identified that, what exactly expressed in terms of those variables, what, is, what, is your, what does your research question become? Um, then are there, are there other things in the data set that, that um, might affect the answer that need to be taken into account? Well, in this case, the clinical investigator certainly thought so. And the second thing, and the final thing is, are there grouping variables? In other words, are there variables which, um, which form clusters in a way in which you might expect the values to be more similar for no particularly good reason than, than if you took them at random? The most, common, the most common kind of grouping variable in health is when you take multiple measurements from the same person because um, measurements from the same patient may well be more similar, regardless of anything else, than, than uh, um, um, measurements taken randomly from other people. So what we're going to do is then, then go back and have a look at, at um, uh, how, how we might ask those questions more precisely. So um, remembering that in terms of the question, those three variables, those the measurements and the difference between them are the key things. I mean, basically one of the, what we want to know is whether the value of the difference changes as the, as the value of oxygen, as the oxygen level changes. Okay, so if we ask the question a bit, a bit more precisely, so we need to ask the question using the variables that, that we've identified, um, then the next thing is to say, okay, um, in that question, what is a response variable and what is an explanatory variable? So the response variable is the thing that you are trying to predict or trying to explain. The explanatory variables are the things that you think might affect that, okay? So in this case, um, the, the, uh, and that should be implicit in your question. So we'll have a look at that. Um, then are there confounders, which we've talked about before, and is there a grouping variable? Okay, so if we apply that to, um, oh, you'll notice that when, when we say what is the response variable and what is the explanatory variable, we also say what kind of data is that? And we'll look at what that, that means in, in a sec. But, the, but the, the real thing about deciding on a, an analysis is that that's mostly determined by what your response variable is. So depending on what kind of data your response variable is, the analysis that you need is going to be different. Okay, so let's go and have a, a look at that. So what that might be. So, so what kind of variables might you have? Okay, so um, they could be continuous measurements. And in this case, the hemoglobin values, we're talking mostly about continuous measurements, right? The, because uh, a continuous measurement is one which um, you can measure with decimal points so that there's effectively an infinite number of possible values between any two points. So it's not, it's not like, for example, a count or a category. Um, then you can have discrete measurements, which are counts. Um, unfortunately, count data requires different analyses to continuous data because counts behave badly in many, many ways. So you, you have to worry about that. It might be a binary category, something that says um, a just, just a value, 
can only have two values, a, a yes or a no, or a survived or died, or an inpatient versus an outpatient. So that's a variable which is a binary category. You could have ordinal categories. You could have, uh, when people um, uh, run surveys with questionnaires, very often the responses are ordinal categories. So you might be asked, um, what did you think of, of your experience here? And please rate it on a scale of one to five, uh, where one means terrible and five means wonderful. And, and so effectively, you may have numbers there, one, two, three, four, five, but they're really categories, but they're an ordered category from terrible to good. Um, you might have categories which are not ranked at all. In other words, uh, so um, uh, you might have ethnicity, for example, which, which there's no ranking to that, but it's a category, not a measurement. Um, and one, and finally, you might have something which is essentially a continuous measurement, but it's very often a very badly behaved continuous measurement. And it's, it's common enough in health research to be treated on its own. So it's the time taken from some, for some event to happen. Um, so it might be in a hospital setting, you might be interested in the time between admission and discharge, for example. Um, and um, we'll come back to this a bit later, but time to event uh, response variables are a pain in the neck, not to put too fine a point on it, but there are ways of handling it. Okay, so going back to our, uh, our, our oxygen measurement data set, um, there are a couple of ways that you might um, express the question that you want the data to answer in this case. Um, one of them we could that probably the simplest way of looking at it is, you know, do the values of the difference between the two measurements, does that change as the, um, as the gold standard measurement changes? In other words, is the, is the difference, does the difference become, for example, less reliable as uh, oxygen levels drop? So, but expressed in terms of the actual variables, we're looking at the values of diff, and, um, and how they are affected by the oxygen level. So is that, is that reasonably clear? Is that all right? Okay. Then the second question is, okay, is there a response variable? Well, yes, of course there is. And, and if so, what kind of data is it? So in this case, um, the difference is, the, is in a sense the response variable. So basically we wanna know how that difference changes as the value of, um, as the oxygen concentration changes. Um, the explanatory variables that are implied by the question, clearly it's the, it's the gold standard oxygen level. So we've got um, um, HbO2, which is also a, a numeric continuous measurement. Okay. Are there confounders? Uh, yes, I mean, well, the, the clinician asking the question definitely thought so. And he, as it turns out, once the analysis was done, he was absolutely right. A lot of those things did indeed affect um, uh, the, the, the difference. Um, um, for example, it turned out that um, Indigenous people tended to have a bigger difference than people classified as non-indifference indigenous, and that's because skin color, it turns out changes the measurement. And, and there were quite a few of those, smoking method as well, which was, I mean, I was very surprised, but the clinician was surprised. Okay, then, then are the values in the response variable grouped in some way? Yes, they were, because we had multiple measurements from each patient, and, and so, the possibility that, that patients differed in ways that we haven't measured um, needs to be built into, into, taken into account. So in that case, yes, the answer is yes. Now, what you've ended up with here is at, at this point, you can specify what analysis you need. Um, if, if both your response and and if your response variable is a numeric measurement, 
um, and at least one of your explanatory variables, and you're going to have several this time because you've got the, the one you're really interested in, but you've also got a bunch of these others. If even one of those is a, is, is a numeric measurement, then you're looking at a regression analysis of some sort. Now, a regression, for those of you who haven't done any, any statistics at all, is basically finding the equation that best, that best links the two variables. In other words, you've got, you, you, you are hunting for an equation which says, um, if I know the value of, of um, uh, HBO2, um, what would I pre what does the data suggest the value of the difference should be? Um, and in and in this case, um, it might be we might make it the absolute value of the difference because uh, in practice, what this was doing was uh, was um, uh, the the as as the value of HBO two got bigger, the spread of the data also also got bigger, it got more variable. So we looked at the absolute value of the difference as well as just what the average difference was. Um, and um, it was end up being quite a complicated model because we had to take into account whether that whether the patient was uh, classified as indigenous. That was probably a surrogate for skin color. Um, and which meant that probably it wasn't a very good variable because um, the color the color of people's skin doesn't isn't strictly indig indigenous or not. There are many other things that affect that. So that certainly came out as a significant effect, but it probably in retrospect wasn't the best measure. But it's the only measure that was available in routinely collected data. So we couldn't. That's the best we could do. Um, <clears throat> and and so so in the end, the, that the equation that said how reliable is the is the is the is the value, um, the the you know the, the the dip get larger. That was affected by about half a dozen of those variables. Um, and. Um, um, and yes, indeed, there were differences between patients, uh, which we discussed at length in the end because they were quite large differences between patients and they may well have been because we, we didn't have a serious measure of skin colour, we just had an indigenous versus non-indigenous. So, um, so basically the analysis that you ended up with was a regression, which says, which is, which is what you have when you've got um, uh, uh, when your explanatory variable is numeric and your response variable is also numeric, but it was was what's called a, a multiple regression because there were many things that affected it, and it was a mixed effects multiple regression because of this grouping. What that means is you had two kinds of explanatory variables. One was the things you were interested in, which which affect the uh, outcome in a systematic way. But the other was just differences between patients, which affects the, the, the answer, but, um, but it's not in a way that you care about. You're not really interested in, um, uh, I mean, it, it's not a helpful difference, if you like, because you don't know what the next patient walking in the door is gonna, where they're gonna fit on, on the range of patients. But in terms of, of um, looking at the, the um, looking at the analysis, you need to do the analysis differently if you've got grouping variables like that. And so you end up with what's called a mixed effects model. So it ended up being, it was a reasonably simple question, but uh, it ended up being quite a complex analysis. But, but once you have answered those, those five questions, um, you may not know yourself what the analysis should look like or how to execute it, but I promise that any statistician you talk to will know um, if you explain those variables to them exactly what analysis you're going to need. So, is, is have I confused? Have I been confusing, or is that is that reasonably okay? All right. Okay. What what we might 
um, do now is have a very a very quick look at um, um, at at when we ask this set of questions, but the answers come out differently. So we we've got we'll we'll have got three sets of questions here. Um, and we'll assume that we've got the data and we and and these questions are pretty close to being expressed in terms of the data. So the first thing is we've got a, a, a data set which has uh, hemoglobin levels for adolescents in, in the Papua New Guinea Highlands. And we want to know, first of all, what those values look like. Um, and secondly, um, uh, since um, hemoglobin levels are um, a diagnostic of anemia, what's the prevalence of, of anemia, however that's classified. So, um, so that's the, so we've got two questions there and, and we want to ask both of them from that data set. So, and then maybe we've got another data set in which we've got, um, we want to ask whether having low hemoglobin levels and, and whether it's trending towards anemia or not, means that you're less likely to survive uh, cardiac surgery. And finally, um, if you're looking at hemoglobin levels, do they change with age or sex? And in other words, do you expect hemoglobin levels to be different as people get older or as um, or between males and females? So um, they're, they're all kind of semi-related questions, but they're, they're different questions and they, they have got in particular um, they're going to have, um, they've got different kinds of variables. In so in this particular, in the first question, if you think about it, we, we only have the response variable. We're not asking, uh, trying to explain what the levels, the hemoglobin levels are. We just want to know for this particular population, what do they look like? What's the spread of, for adolescents in, in Highland Papua New Guinea, what what's what's the what what does that look like? So, and those are for hemoglobin levels. That's a continuous measurement, um, and so we'll need descriptions that that in, in order to describe that. That's what we'll we'll go for. But at, but the prevalence of anemia anemia you, is is it's it's a fairly artificial split, but it's a split nonetheless. And you know, it's either you've got it or you haven't. And so that's a binary category, and, and basically it would be identified as yes or no for each participant. Um, for this one, um, if you think about what's the what's the um, uh, uh, response variable and what's the explanatory, I mean, what you want to know, what you want to explain is the survival. Right? In other words, you want to know. Can something of can the explanatory variable that I'm interested in predict um, the, the probability of surviving cardiac surgery? So in this case, the response is a binary category. Okay. Um, but the explanatory variable is the hemoglobin level, which is which is a continuous measurement again. You might decide, and people often do, to say. I'd prefer it if this was a category as well, um, in which case you might say anemic versus not anemic and look at that. Okay, but you might equally leave it as a as a as a measurement. So you've got alternatives with that. In this third question, um, the we're asking about hemoglobin levels. So that's going to be the response variable. And we're asking whether age and, and gender affects, if you like, normal hemoglobin levels. So the response is a measurement, but we've got two kinds of explanatory variables, one of which is a measurement and one, one of which is a category. So um, age is, is in a sense a measurement, unless you, again, unless you group it deliberately. Um, but, um, but the second one, um, is, is just a category. So, um, so at that point, we, we answered the first question about for, for each of the possible questions here. Um, so then we can say, we've got the response and explanatory variables. 
do we have confounders? And that's going to depend on, on whether it's in the data set, whether you can, whether you can prove it or not. In, uh, if we're looking at highland populations, it's very possibly possible that um, that altitude is going to affect that, and some people are living in villages on higher mountains than other people. Um, but that may or may not have been recorded, so you may not know that. Um, uh, age and sex could be because, um, the, but you don't you don't really know. Um, well, in this case, potentially there are many confounders because many, many things are likely to affect um, whether somebody survives cardiac surgery or not. Um, so hemoglobin is going to be one of them, but um, uh, things like age and gender, whether how serious the disease is, what the history of disease, whether there are any other comorbid effects, all of those are likely to be quite serious, have quite serious effects on the probability of survival. And which means that you've got to take all of those into account if you can, and the data set provides those, in order to answer the question, does hemoglobin matter? Okay, so you've just got to, you, when there are confounders and they're serious, in this case, they absolutely would be serious, you, you need to try and take them into, I mean, it's very likely, for example, that, that being, being 20 versus 90 is a serious confounder, um, as is the other things you've got wrong with you at the time, um, and possibly more important than the value of the hemoglobin level. So if you want to ask the question about hemoglobin, you, your analysis has to take those other influences into account. Um, in the third thing, well, potentially yes, many many things can affect hemoglobin level. If you if you're eating if you if you're eating um, a diet which doesn't have any iron in it, you might very well have low hemoglobin levels. Um, so nutritional status, altitude definitely affects hemoglobin levels. Um, smoking, to, somewhat to my surprise, when I looked it up, does. There are several diseases which either increase or decrease tend to, to show increases or de decreases in, in, uh, in hemoglobin levels. Dehydration will, will affect it, for example. So, but, and, the, and the question is, um, again, with, with routinely, collected, co routinely collected data, you may not be able to do that, but, but it's worth thinking about what you would, what you would like to include um, uh, to see whether the question is seriously answerable. Okay, so at that point, um, are there grouping variables? Well, um, if you don't have altitude as one of the as part of the data in this first question, in other words, you don't know what altitude they've been living at, um, but you do know what village they came from, um, then then there may be differences between villages, which are essentially a surrogate for differences in altitude. So you might want to treat village as a grouping variable when you when you look at the uh, when you look at this kind of effect. Um, with with the second question, probably not, I guess, I mean, not many people have more than one lot of cardiac surgery. So you're probably not gonna, at least I hope you don't. I mean, like, you probably know more about that than I do. Um, but you might have other groups that that matter, for example, um, if, if, um, if different hospitals tend to have different outcomes, I mean, or, or, or maybe some hospitals do more, um, only have the difficult cases and, and consequently tend to have worse outcomes. Um, uh, so, so you might want to group by hospital and you might want to group by who's doing the surgery, um, if you know those things. But, but um, again, Probably not because it's probably not in the data set. Um, with, with this last thing, well, it's going to depend on the study design. So um, uh, if, for example, you this was part of a, um, uh, a longitudinal study, in other words, people have been, you, you've got 
collected data from a hospital which actually goes back 30 years, which is, I think, probably unlikely. You might very well have um, the same patient at different ages and consequently some, some grouping you could do there. But on the whole, um, probably unlikely if it's a, a short-term data set. Okay, so at that point, um, you could think about what analysis you'd need for each of those too. So um, for this first one, we're really only looking to describe it. I mean, we haven't, the question doesn't say what affects hemoglobin levels, it just says, what are they? So at that point, um, you've got um, a set of hemoglobin measurements and, and you'll do the standard ways of describing them, which is averages, measures of spread, um, variances in standard deviations, maybe skewness, because sometimes those distributions are not symmetric. If it's, if it's, if it's very skewed, you might want to move away from means and, and, and standard deviations and use the median instead as the, as the descriptive, which is kind of, if you put all the data in order, the median is the middle value. So it's the, it's the, there are as many people with values lower than that as there, there are values higher than that. So for some, if you've got, if the data has a weird distribution, um, then you, you might want to use median range in, and so on instead. But for the prevalence of anemia, that, if you remember, is, we, is a binary category. And there's really only one way to describe that, and that's as a proportion. In other words, what proportion of the adolescents you looked at had anemia? Um, from that proportion, you can estimate what, is, what its confidence interval should be from however many patients you had. I mean, in other words, the sample size will give you an estimate of, of how confident you are in your estimate. So, but basically for this one, you're not doing any, anything. Um, you're not asking complicated questions. You're just asking, what do the values look like? For this one, um, the analysis you need has to be something which can handle a response variable, which is a binary category. And the answer to that is pretty much always a logistic regression. So that's a that's an analytical technique which is designed to handle responses which are binary, yes, no's, and so on. Um, if you if um, you have grouping variables as well as the explanatory variables. Um, you go back to a mixed effects logistic regression too. So you have you might have patient or surgeon or hospital as a random effect, uh, as well as the as well as the fixed effects that you that were the it's the key explanatory variable and the confounders. If you had simplified it massively, there are there are simpler analyses you could do. If, for example, um, you had if you instead of using the actual hemoglobin value as your explanatory, explanatory variable, you just said you classified them as, as anemic versus non-anemic, um, then you could you then you could do a simpler analysis of a chi square. But but in this case, you almost certainly will have. Um, more explanatory variables than that. And, and if you've got more than one, then you're back to uh, logistic regression. So by and large, um, again, once you know the answer to, the quest to those previous questions, um, you or whoever you ask to help at this point can, can, um, um, uh, can help you handle that. With this one, um, it's, it's going to be like the very first example we looked, like, looked at, it's going to be a regression. Um, but, but there are many, many kinds of regression. And, and to some extent, um, the way you describe it and analyze it depends on the shape of that. I mean, if, it's, if, if it just, uh, for example, goes down with age, which it doesn't, um, then straight down, then you're talking about a linear regression. If it goes, if it goes up and, and then comes down again, you've got to fit 
a line or generate an equation which can mimic that that change in that increase and decrease as it happens. Um, if the if the um, if the relationship is more complicated than that, in other words, um, as I if I seem to remember correctly, the, the there is a, a change in adolescence which is quite peaky, and then things change more gradually after that. You might need um, a, a a fancier model for the kind of regression you use, but it will be some sort of regression, and the and the kind of regression you want, which again anybody you ask to help will will know to look for, um, is going to depend on what the shape of that relationship is. So. Um, but I mean, I guess the key point I want to, to make here is that that the 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 answer to what what kind of analysis you want depends about ninety percent on what your response variable is. So uh, once you've identified that, you can you 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 can essentially narrow down your options substantially. Um, okay, so um, if uh, if I understand that most of you didn't have very much in the way of statistical background. So um, it's, it's, once you, when it's, it's worth you having a look at your data to, to ask those questions first. But, um, but once things start to get complicated, if you don't have a fairly substantial statistics background, it's time to ask for help. Um, in my experience, the, 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 the occasions when help is most often needed, um, even for people who've done some statistics in the past, is, oops, let's go back a bit. Um, if the response is a count, then it's almost guaranteed. I mean, counts are quite difficult to analyze because they behave in weird ways. So um, if, if it's, for example, um, if, you, if it's just, how many symptoms did this did different kinds of patients show? Um, then and and that count is the thing you want to is your response variable. Then it's worth asking for help quite early. Um, if there if if it's a if it's a binary category or a proportion that you've calculated from binary categories, the problem the problem with with all of these, but in particular this one, which is an incredibly common kind of analysis needed in health is that introductory statistics courses do not teach logistic regression. So that, so that even if you've done a little bit, uh, a bit of statistics, you're unlikely to have come across that or been able to be taught how to use it. If the response is a category with multiple levels, um, then, then that life is worse. The time to event one is worth mentioning because the problem with the time to event response is that um, very often it has it, 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 the event doesn't happen. So you've got a set of times which is your response, but but some of your some of your subjects. Um, so suppose suppose it's the if it's admission to discharge, some of your subjects in the data set you have haven't been discharged yet. So they're still in hospital. So you've got two kinds of data in there, one of which you do have a time for, and some of which you don't have an actual time for, but you know, the one thing you know is that it's longer than the time they've been in hospital already. So if you just leave those out, you're going to underestimate the, 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 the time between admission and departure, because you're leaving out the longer ones because they are more likely not to have, have reached the event by the time by the time the uh, study finishes. So um, those those four responses are, are almost always require some help. Um, if your explanatory variable is a measurement and the um, and the and the and and so is your response and it's not a straight line then usually that needs help. And um, almost all but everybody needs help with when there's a group in there with mixed effects. So um, the, 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 the trick is that, that 
um, in many ways, people who have never done any statistics are safer because they know from the beginning that, that they're going to ask for help when the analysis comes in. And so, the, 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 and so by and large, um, once you've worked out what kind of analysis, what, what your response variables are, what your explanatory variables are, whether you've got a grouping, um, you can explain that to the person you want to help you and they will certainly be able to know what to do. Um, if, you, if people have got a little bit of statistics, then the temptation is to try and force the analysis to be something you know about. And, um, and one of the reasons it, it is really important to go through that sequence of, of what, of, of, you know, what's your response for, what are the explanatory, is it a group and other confounders, is to avoid that. Because by and large, if you apply a simpler analysis, which, which you always can, to the data that you've got, then in general, uh, one of two bad things will happen. One is that um, the answer won't be right. Um, because, for example, you may not have taken confounders into account, and that means that may mean that you don't identify an effect which is really there because you haven't allowed for um, other things which can affect the answer. The other bad thing which can happen is that, is that when you want to publish the, the results, the reviewer um, has a better idea about what analysis should have been done than you do, and, and, and so they complain at that point. So... Um, both in terms of the conclusions you draw and your capacity to publish the results of your research, it's, it's important to get the, the, the stuff right. So, um, um, so what I'd like to, to emphasise at the end is, I mean, don't hesitate to ask for help, but it's good to get to the point where you, you can explain to the, to the person uh, uh, doing it um, what the complications are likely to be and what they need to take into account in order to get to get the right answer to your question. Okay. All right, I think I've gone slightly over time actually, but then but so is it does anybody have any queries about any of that? No, I think it's more just putting it into practice really. I think it is. Okay. I mean the the as I said, I mean the 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 as we said in the in the first first um, talk in this series, the, um, uh, the the thing that takes the time is getting the data and getting it and cleaning it up and getting it into the right form. But once you've got it in the right form, oops, we won't do that. Um, once you once you get rid of the once you've cleaned up the data. It's really worth going through that process because, I mean, it's perfectly possible for the people you ask for help to do the analysis not to necessarily, they won't, they're not going to be clinicians, right? Mm. So that you know much more about the subject matter than they do. And consequently, you know more about what really needs to be taken into account and what complications might be than the person who you ask to analyse the data for you. So, I mean, it's really important to go through that process so that you have identified the complications and then you can, and then you can ask for help in a ways that let you be critical about what's suggested to you. Mm. Okay. And I mean, I, 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 um, it's, it's, it's almost, once things get complicated and in, in, in health research, I have to say, they almost always bloody well get complicated. Mm. <laughs> Um, it's it's always it's usually worth asking for help, um, but it's also it's worth coming into that request um, with with um, a, a reasonably clear understanding that you have about what the complication should be, so that you're not you don't just do what the analyst says when the analyst has actually suggested something in a, which is in a clinical sense really stupid is mm. what gets analysed. And so it's it's really important that both sides of that of of the conversation understand enough about each other's business to to do a sensible analysis. Okay. Yep. All right. Any other any other questions that anybody'd like to ask? Okay. Well. <laughs>
thank you for thank you for coming along. That was uh, and um, and I hope that was useful to you. Thanks, Rhonda. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Talk to you later. Bye.